Okay, uh, obviously, as the PowerPoint says, we are going to take a look at uh, Jesus and the Gentiles. Um, I know the, my, my last couple classes have been on, um, you know, like Jesus and the Samaritans. I think I did Jesus and the scribes, uh, Jesus and the tax collectors. So we're going to give Jesus and the Gentiles a, uh, a shot um, today. So let's, let's talk about the class in general. Uh, number one, obviously, we'll take a look at, um, you know, some New Testament passages that apply to this, I think, where God is telling the children of Israel hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ is born that there will be a Messiah, that there is a path uh, for the Gentiles to gain salvation. We'll take a look at that. We're going to look at, um, you know, Jesus' uh, interactions, some of his first interactions with the Gentiles. Uh, and then, if we have time, I think we will, I have a, uh, a video about some of the ancient remedies uh, that the ancient Jews and other people uh, in Israel would use to try to get better. A lot of the, uh, you know, the superstition and stuff like that, some of the more, um, I don't know, maybe gruesome remedies, or oftentimes the remedy was worse than the, uh, than the actual uh, issue that they were having. Hi, Judy. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. You, you, were, you thought you were going to sneak in. You're not sneaking in. <laughs> we always love to see you, Judy. All right. Um, so, first of all, we know from Jesus' interactions, and he said this to the Samaritan woman, uh, that he was sent, uh, I think he sent this, uh, said this to the Pharaoh, uh, to the Canaanite woman, uh, but he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That was his primary goal, was to preach the gospel message of hope uh, to his fellow Jews. That's who he was sent to. He was a Jew himself. We know this. And he was sent to his own people to tell them to come back to God, to turn back to God, uh, that there was uh, a hope of the... You know, just think about the suffering and the oppression that he was going... that um, the children of Israel were going through with, uh, you know, with the Romans. And so the Romans always kind of play a part. They're always in the mix, oftentimes in the background, but they're still there. And they were really the oppressive Gentiles, right? You had a group of Gentiles that were oppressing the children of God. And so we, you know, we've talked about this too, about the different factions that came out of this time period, right? There was a faction uh, of, of people called the Zealots, that were just hardcore and they wanted to get rid of all, any influence from the Greeks or, or the Romans within Israel. They wanted, you know, Israel for, you know, Ju Judea for the Jews, so to speak, right? Type of thing. Okay, so where, where, where do we get this idea that the Gentiles are also, uh, you know, God has a plan and purpose for the Gentiles? Well, I mean, you could say that it's found uh, from the very beginning in Genesis, right? But we'll take a look at a, a couple. Uh, from uh, the prophet Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah, the second chapter. This is one that should be familiar to us, right? This is also found in Micah, the fourth chapter. Uh, so we've actually, we've actually got two prophets that speak of this and actually use a lot of the same verbiage uh, as far as a future hope, a future time when God, uh, through his son, will reign through the earth. Uh, verse 2, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways. We'll walk in his paths for out of the law out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. So that's, that's a great prophecy, right? It's talking about a future time when God's will would be done throughout all the earth, all the wars that we see now, the tumult that we see now, is going to be done away with, and God will reign in righteousness through his Son. 
Um, and so that was an important part of the Old Testament. There is, uh, there's several of these, right, where God is kind of telling the children of Israel through his prophets that this isn't just your hope. Yes, the oracles of God were given to you. Yes, the law of Moses was the foundation uh, of, of this wonderful hope. But it's going to be expanded not just to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles as well. And who is at the center point of that? Well, even though he was sent to the lost sheep of the tribes of Israel, Christ is at the center of this. He is going to be the catalyst by which the Gentiles are grafted in, as Paul tells us in Romans, right? They're grafted in into the hope, um, the hope that was given to the Jews as well. Okay, Isaiah, uh, Isaiah we're still in Isaiah 56. Very similar words, 56. Um, 56, verse 6. Well, first, um, you know, verse 56. Thus say, uh, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Well, that's talking about Christ, isn't it? Right? Here are those themes again that we find out, find throughout uh, both the major prophets and also the minor prophets, this idea of keep ye judgment and do justice, right? Micah is going to talk about that in Micah 6.6, 6, very similar words. For my righteousness is about to be revealed, okay? And, you know, there's, uh, there's that little whiff of John the Baptist in that as well, right, which Isaiah talks about as well. But let's take a look at verse 6. Also... The sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people, okay? And we know that Christ is actually going to use this, right? When, he's, when is he going to use this? He's going to quote here in, uh, from uh, Isaiah and also from Jeremiah, by the way. But when, when does he use these, these, these words? Say again, Jim. Right, he purges the temple, right? He's going to, he, when he purges the temple, these are the words that he's going to use, okay, which is pretty which is pretty good, okay? So even when he's kind of clearing the temple, which was in the court of the Gentiles, by the way, it was where the Gentiles were supposed to go to worship, okay? It was the closest that they could get to the temple of God. And what was in the, what was in the, um, the court of the Gentiles? Well, uh, the, the, the money changers had taken it over, okay? And they had animals and everything else. And so the Gentiles had no place to worship, okay? And this is one of the things that Jesus was concerned about, okay? So again... Was Jesus sent to the lost sheep of the tribes of Israel? Absolutely. Did that mean he had no dealings with the Gentiles? Of course not. All right. And then lastly in Isaiah, uh, the 60th chapter. Yeah, this is, this is a good one. Uh, we're going to look at uh, verses 1 through 5, okay? Uh, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about, and see, all they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Thy son shall come from far, and thy daughter shall be nursed at thy side. Then thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. So the Gentiles are mentioned quite a bit, and it's, there's some wonderful imagery that is used here, right? About darkness and light, that God revealed his light to mankind through his Son. And where did that happen? That happened, obviously, in the, in the land of Israel, right? The world was in darkness. They didn't know the way of God. And so God in his love and in his mercy provides the light for first the children of Israel, but also to the Gentiles. 
and we know, brothers and sisters, that uh, Christ is going to, even though he has said these words, right? He says, look, I was sent to the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. That was, that's my primary mission, okay? But he also was sent to all mankind. And uh, let's, let's take a look at this in Matthew, uh, actually in um, the, the end, uh, yeah, in, in Acts chapter 1. Uh, da, 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 na, not, sorry, mock. Let's try mock. <coughs> yeah, uh, mock 16 in verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow thee that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And so this was Christ's commission uh, to the children of, uh, to, to his disciples. Go out into the world. Preach the gospel. Okay? So even though he had a very specific primary um, primary commission to the Jewish people. Now he's telling his followers, it's not just the Jewish people anymore. Go out to all of the world. And we know that Paul is going to be the great apostle to the Gentiles. But we know from looking at the Acts, he always started in synagogues, right? So he's, he's going to use the, the Jewish people and kind of their infrastructure to... Um, you know, to kind of start that process of preaching to the Gentiles. Because there were Gentiles that were very interested in what the Jews had to preach. They were very interested in this idea of monotheism. Hmm. It was so completely different than what was going on in the world at that time, which had no lie, tens of thousands of different gods that you had to keep track of, right? Most people didn't keep track of them. They had, you know, a handful of different gods that they really focused in on. But this idea of monotheism. Who are these Jews? The, these Jewish people, they got their synagogue. They're very different, right? They're very kind of anti-establishment a little bit, right? This had, this had an impact on a certain amount of people, and there were believers of, the, of God, I think uh, Paul, Paul um, styles them, that they weren't Jews, but they were Gentiles that were interested in the gospel. And this is where, you know, slowly but surely, you know, after, uh, you know, so much confrontation with the Jewish people uh, or the Jewish leaders in these different synagogues, he says, look, we, you know, I turn to, I turn to the Gentiles. I'm going to go to the Gentiles. And from that point on, we're going to see a separation, aren't we, from the Jewish synagogues with Paul going in a different direction, focusing mainly uh, on uh, Gentile converts. All right. Any questions, comments? Yes, Brother Steve. When you go right back to the promises to Abraham, you know, the promise to Abraham was that all nations would be blessed through him. Yes. And so this is, this is not like an add-on. Right. It was like, oh, let's also remember these people. Right. I mean, the whole plan was that all the earth would be filled with the glory of God. The yeah. whole plan was that all nations would be blessed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point, Steve. Thank you. Yes, absolutely, Brother Chris. Since, since we have a break. Sure. Is this on? Definitely. Yes. So we, we often think of Jesus uh, trying to bring us you know, back to God. Uh, but in, in fact, you mentioned the idea that he was revealing something. He was the light of the world. He was... Uh, bringing to light something that was hidden in the Old Testament, but he was trying to bring them forward. The, the law was a schoolmaster to bring us forward to Christ. Yes. So something we can learn from that is, uh, you know, Jesus is trying to bring us forward to God, not trying to bring us back. And, and that was the problem with the Jews is they wanted to go back to the law. They right. didn't want to go forward yeah. and why they wouldn't uh, accept his message. Okay, so he's trying to reveal something while they're trying to hold on to the past. You right. know? So uh, 
whenever we use the terms back and forward, uh, we should think of God as bringing us forward. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I got you. That's a good point, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, and it's, you know, you can understand how difficult it would be, right, for a certain groups of Jews during this time who all they see is oppression. They see oppression from the religious le their religious leaders, right? But they also see oppression from the Romans. The Romans were a daily reminder that they were not free. It was a daily reminder that they had masters, vicious, mean masters. And they weren't free to do what they wanted. They weren't free to control uh, their own state, their own nation. And so that's going to bother a lot of people. And it's going to culminate, as we know, right, in A.D. 70. There's going to be a full-on revolt, well, starting in A.D. 66. But there's going to be a full-on revolt against Roman, uh, Roman uh, you know, rule. And the Romans are going to be merciless when they come in. They're going to just, you know, kill tens of thousands of people. They're going to destroy uh, the Temple Mount. Uh, and they're going to scatter uh, a lot of the Jewish people, take them captive. I mean, there's actually a relief that you can go, uh, Titus's arch, right? You can go into Rome, and you can see it. And what does it depict? It depicts uh, Jewish, um, you know, Jewish people enslaved, br being brought back to the uh, to Rome to be sold in the, uh, you know, to be sold as slaves in the slave market. And you know, just think about that life, right? Uh, there's actually one of. Uh, I, I believe in that, uh, the Arch of Titus, they're actually carrying uh, the candlestick, right, from, uh, from inside of the temple as a, you know, as a piece of booty, right? And, all, and just think about all the, uh, all, all the stuff that they brought out of the temple. I mean, millions of dollars worth of uh, gold, right? That, that's, that, that's right, yeah, bro Brother Steve just said it paid for the Colosseum, 100% correct. Uh, and there, there's, um, there's some evidence as well that some of the Jews, Jewish slaves, were actually uh, brought in to work on the Colosseum as well. So, you know, Tita, uh, Vespasian and Titus are going to use that money to kind of, you know, build this Colosseum and then have all these awesome games. And people are like, yeah, Vespasian is the best. Titus is the best, right? And it keeps the people placated, right? Uh, bread and circuses, as they said. You feed them, give them a little wine and then entertain them, and they're going to be fine, right? You can tax them, and they're not going to do anything. All right. Uh, so let's take a look at Matthew. Matthew chapter 8. Yeah, so this is, um, this is, this is interesting here. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 11. Um, so this is actually, and we'll look at this probably next week, but this is his interaction with the centurion, a Gentile, okay? And this is kind of his postscript. This is what he speaks to his disciples after this event. Let's take a look at it. Uh, Matthew 8, beginning in verse 11. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the, children of the king, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So there's, there's some imagery that Christ is using, right? He's talking about people coming from all kinds of different places, from the east and the west, right? Which is a euphemism from everybody. All nations are coming. And it says that they're going to shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I think other, uh, other renditions talks about lounging, right? Kind of, you know, lounging back. It was you're having a meal, a very relaxed meal with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Think about that visual, okay? Um, but you yourself are cast out. In other words, the children of the kingdom, the Jewish people, Jesus is saying, the children of the kingdom would be cast out, the thing that they were longing for. But the Gentiles would be the ones that would be dining, reclining, I think that was the word, reclining at dinner with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, and so Christ is saying this. And he says this right after he heals the servant of a centurion, a Roman centurion. Right? This guy's 
the Roman institution in, in Judea was hated. And this guy was a representation. But we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more because he was, you know, he was, the centurion actually was a very, he was very kind to the Jewish people and cared for them. And this, this happened a lot, you know, where, where Romans, you know, Roman soldiers from all different places of the, of the world come and they're, they said, okay, you're in the army for 20 years, right? This is where you're going to be staying. And you're like, yeah, I'm staying in Israel. Uh, I, you know, you know nothing about it. But then, you know, you spend a lot of time there and you acclimate yourself to the people. Oftentimes they would take um, wives, okay, from, from the surrounding areas, from, from those people. So who knows? We don't, we're not really told the background. We'll, we'll, we'll do a deep dive next, next week in, uh, on the centurion and some other people. Okay? So Jesus is using this imagery again that's taken, actually, brothers and sisters, right from the Old Testament, right? Right from Isaiah. It's very seamless. Like, uh, you know, Brother Chris said, this isn't something new, right? Um, and Brother Steve said the same thing. Okay. Now, let's talk about the very first Gentiles. Okay, now, there is some um, uh, controversy, right, uh, around, <laughs> around this. You know, what were the wise men, uh, Jews or Gentiles? Okay, I think they were Gentiles, okay, who obviously had been exposed um, to Jewish thought and Jewish ideas and Jewish uh, religion as well. Um, because we know there was, uh, you know, the Jews were brought to Babylon. The majority of Jews, brothers and sisters in Babylon, stayed in Babylon. They didn't go back to Jerusalem. They acclimated themselves. They stayed there. And there was a Jewish presence in this area, uh, I think, until very recently. I think like the last Jew in Baghdad finally died or was driven out or something like that, like 10 years ago, I think. But during this time, uh, there was a sizable population of Jewish people living in Babylon. And so you know that uh, you know, they would have obviously come in contact with these people, had conversations with them. But so the wise men from the east are going to be the very first Gentiles that are going to... Uh, uh, they're going to see Jesus. You know, the shepherds see him obviously first out in the field. And then, uh, you know, later on, we're really not told, you know, how, how long afterward. But anyways, uh, you know, and we, there's, you know, how many wise men were there? Well, traditionally, you know, it says there are three wise men. The Bible doesn't really say that there were three wise men. It doesn't give us a number, but we know that they brought three gifts. So, you know, not a big deal either way. They're coming from the east. They see this light, right? So just think about that. You know, oftentimes in Scripture we can read the words, but we don't really internalize the meaning of those words. I'll give you an example. The wise men came from the east. Okay? Well, what does that mean, the wise men coming from the east? Well, it means that they have to travel like five, 600 miles following this star, right, and wherever it's going. So there's a tremendous amount of curiosity, number one, courage. But, you know, obviously they're really committed to finding out what the deal is with this, uh, with this star. What's going on? This was, this was something incredible that they saw. Now, these Magi, okay, uh, they were ancient Persian priests. There, was an, there is, and it's still around today, there's an ancient Persian religion called Zoroastrian. And they, they, they're, um, they're kind of monotheistic in a way. Their main god, or their only god, is Ahura Mazda. And they've been worshiping him for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, there's, still some, uh, there's still some Zoroastrians around uh, in, Is uh, not Israel, in uh, Iran today. But most of them were wiped out when the, uh, when the Arabs came up in, um, what, 700s? They came up there and they, you know, they converted to Islam, all of them by force, mostly. Anyways, um, so let's just take a look at Daniel, uh, the fifth chapter here. I haven't turned to Daniel in a while. This is the first Daniel turn. Ezekiel, oh, here we are. All right, Daniel chapter 5 and verse 11. So it's going to, these, these are who they're talking about here, these, the wise men, okay? Um, 
This is when uh, Belshazzar sees the, you know, meeny, meeny, tickle you frassen. He sees and he's like, what's going on? We need guys. I don't know what's going on. Please send, send for the, uh, the, holy, the holy wise men, okay? Verse 11, there is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. He's speaking about Daniel. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Right? And so Daniel was recognized as the head of all the wise men. Okay? He was, he was put in charge of all of these different people. They were really the advisors for the king of Babylon at this time. But, you know, there's a lot of other stuff going on here too. Astrologers, magicians, soothsayers. So they had a wide variety of knowledge, okay, that they could share with uh, people. And these, these are the type of people uh, that, that are coming to see Jesus. So uh, I think it's kind of a foreshadow, right? When you look at what Isaiah is talking about, all the people, they shall come from the east and west, right? Well, where did the Magi come from? They came from the east. They're already coming into the land of Israel to see the Messiah. Right at his birth, you know, we have this kind of happening. Uh, the prophecies of Isaiah and Micah and other places are coming, coming to pass with the birth of Jesus. Um, all right, in Matthew chapter 2, There's a couple things we can take a look at here. We know that uh, Jesus is, Jesus, you know, Mary and Joseph are going to go down into Egypt. Again, <clears throat> there is a sizable population of Jews that lived in Egypt, particularly in Alexandria, um, but in other places. And so that would make sense, right, for, for Joseph and Mary to go down there. But one of the things I want to get, get at is... Um, you know, Jesus is going to come in contact with all types of different people. You know, he's down in Egypt. He's going to see Egyptians, right? When he's living up in Nazareth. Nazareth had a lot of different people coming, uh, coming and going in that area, okay? The further away you got from Jerusalem and Judea, the more mixed and the more diverse ethnic, ethnically it became, all right? Closer to Jerusalem, heavy, heavy Jewish population. The further away from Jerusalem, oh, now you got all kinds of different people. Particularly up north, up in the up in uh, Ga the Galilee, um, you know, who knows? It's a hodgepodge up there, right? It's kind of like the we talked about. It. It's kind of like the Wild West in a lot of different ways. All right. So Jesus was not didn't live an isolated life, just kind of in Jewish culture. He obviously was steeped in it, but he knew of other people. Right? He saw different, different types of people. He came in contact with them. All right? um, and so he would, he would have seen and come across all types of different people from all over the region. Uh, why did I put Matthew 2 here? Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. This is about, um, yeah, in verse 11. Uh, and when they, verse 10. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And it says, you know, they came into the house, they worshipped Jesus, and when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, uh, gold and franks, frankincense and myrrh. And so they actually come. It's really interesting that the wise men come down to Jerusalem, and they're like, hey, where is, I think they asked this question, where is, uh, yeah. Yeah, in verse um in the wise men, verse 1, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. So they're thinking they're coming down, and it's going to be like a, like a big celebration that the Messiah has been born. And meanwhile, no one knows nothing. And Herod actually is like, What? King of the Jews? Wait a minute, I'm the king of the Jews. Right? And so he's going he's gonna to try to quash that immediately. And we know that this is when, um, you know, the death of the innocents is going to happen. He's going to send, you know, his troops down into, um, into Bethlehem and kill all the, you know, the toddlers, two years old and, and under. You know, it's awful situation. 
All right, last thing we'll take a look at um, before we take a look at this video here. In Matthew 4, and we'll, we'll, end, with, we'll end with this, uh, with this quote here. Um, yeah, verse 23, chapter 4, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, in healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Okay, so he's healing them. He's preaching the kingdom of God. Well, who is he preaching to? Who is he healing? Well, and his fame went through all Syria. Huh. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with torments, uh, uh, with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, and from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. So there's people coming from all over, from Syria. Syria is not Israel, brothers and sisters. He's having Gentiles. Right when he starts his, his ministry uh, in, in the Galilee, Immediately, he's coming into contact with Gentiles. Immediately, he's healing these people. Okay, and so again, even though he's not sent primarily to Gentiles, and he'll get into this in his talk, you know, there's always the crumbs that fall from the master's table, right? And so this, I think this is a great example. He's up in Syria. I got you, Steve. He's up in Syria, and, uh, you know, the Syrians are coming. People from Decapolis are coming as well. The capitalist was filled with Gentiles, Jews and Gentiles coming to Christ to be healed. It's great. It's great imagery. Brother Steve. So you just brought us through the temptation of Jesus and, and all of these Gentiles that are sort of coming to him. And right after the temptation of Jesus, he's in Nazareth. Yes. And, and he goes into the synagogue there in Nazareth, and he reads from the scroll of Isaiah, yes. and his neighbors are like, who is this guy? Right. And, and Jesus replies to them and says, look, you know, in the time of Elijah, there were a lot of widows in Israel. But who did Elijah heal? Mm. Right. Who did Elijah help? Right. It was the widow of where was it? Zarephath. Yeah. Zarephath. Yeah. You know, so, so it wasn't a Jew. Right. It was a Gentile. Yes. And then he says, you know, in, in Elisha's time, there were a lot of lepers in Israel. But who did he heal? Naaman, Naaman. you know, not a Jew. And I think that, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I thought that was really fast. And, and they're incensed over this, yeah. and that's why they wanted to throw him over the cliff, because right. they thought, you know, it was just for the Jews. Yeah, absolutely. That's great, Steve, yes. And so even, even when he's starting out on his ministry, there's that little piece there of, you know, spreading the gospel to the Gentiles as well, yes. Brother Chris. Making the same point, but it's something no. I, had, I hadn't seen, and it kind of goes back to, you know, just another way of saying something that I previously said, but looking at the Magi coming uh, gives us an idea that the religious elite in Babylon was preoccupied with, with the coming, watching and waiting for the coming of the Messiah to fulfill Daniel's prophecy. And when we compare that to what the Jewish elite in Jerusalem was preoccupied with sweeping the house clean and trying to go back to fulfill the law, which uh, they couldn't do the first time around, but they were so preoccupied with that, again, they refused to come forward. So it's interesting to see, you know, again, what was the, at the foremost thought of those coming from the East was looking for the coming Messiah, where there, those in Jerusalem were so preoccupied with uh, the minutiae that they missed the big picture entirely. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Very good. All right, so we're going to we're going to stop there for now, okay? Next week we'll get into, um, you know, some of, some of the other uh, instances where Jesus is going to interact with different Gentiles, uh, heal different Gentile peoples as well, uh, and we'll take a look at maybe some of the lessons, right? What are some of the lessons that we can take from these wonderful stories and apply into our lives, okay? Uh, that's always really, a, you know, that's why they're written for us, right? Well, how do we... These are wonderful stories, right? Are they making an impact on us, right? That's always the question. Yeah, we read the Bible a lot. We know our Bibles. We can quote the Bible. Is it, is it written on our hearts? Are we using it as the roadmap to our salvation? So, 
All right, so this video right here will start. We'll probably watch like 10 minutes of it somewhere around there. And it's called, uh, uh, what is it called? It's called Life, um, you know, Life in Biblical Times. Let me pull this up here, yeah. Uh, what was everyday life like when Jesus was alive? It's two hours and a half, okay? We're not, we're not reading, we're going to watch this. Hold on, people, people are dinging me right now. I got, I got several dings. Oh. Reposition my mic. Yes, repositioning my mic. Sister Penny, is that better? Thank you. All right. All right, so we're, th this section right here is about um, some of the ancient, uh, you know, practices around medicine, okay? And what, you know, when Jesus was a healer, right? These are the... Jesus is, you know, he's healing all of these people. So they all have different issues that they're dealing with. Well, outside of Jesus, how would you deal with an issue that you had, like a, some kind of medical issue? Well, it's not great, brothers and sisters, right? And so you can, you can understand why Jesus was so popular, right? Uh, you can just imagine what these poor people went through to try to get some relief from their, uh, from their infirmities. All right, this guy's pretty good. Job is teaching history, but now... I want to live it. 